everyone. Welcome to Grace Presbyterian Church. We're delighted to have you here to worship the Lord with us on uh, this very snowy spring morning. So uh, we're not living in a winter wonderland. We're living in a spring wonderland. Uh, but here we are. And this is uh, the day the Lord has made for us and uh, the weather he has sent for us. I have a friend in uh, North Carolina, and she's always fascinated with how late in the season it snows here. So uh, I send pictures, I was sending her some pictures this morning, and uh, a bit bemoaning the fact that it's a big day for Grace, we're ordaining uh, an elder and two new deacons today, and uh, I was bemoaning the fact the weather may uh, hinder attendance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, her counsel to me was, go to church and worship the God who creates snow. So I thought, you know, that's pretty good counsel, and uh, that's what we're here to do today. A few announcements for you. Ladies Bible study, the last session this week, will be held on Zoom only. I believe there is a misprint in your bulletin. It says Monday, but that's Tuesday, correct, ladies? Yes. Somebody, it is Tuesday, so that's a misprint in the bulletin. Tuesday evening, last session on Zoom. Please save the dates for Vacation Bible School. Uh, I know it doesn't seem like... Uh, Time to think about VBS when it's snowing outside, but July will be here before we know it, and uh, we want to be prepared for that. So save the dates. Uh, if you can volunteer to help with that, uh, please contact the church office. We've had a missions emphasis in the month of March, and that continues this evening with our brother Miguel de Azevedo, who will be speaking in our evening service. Miguel and his family are headed to Okinawa, Japan, where he will serve as a pastor. And uh, he's going to open God's word for us tonight and tell us a little bit about that work. So we're certainly looking forward to that. As I mentioned earlier, we have the great joy today of ordaining a new elder as well as two new deacons uh, to serve here in the life and ministry of Grace Church. We will be having that ordination after the morning sermon. And then there's a special cake during fellowship time, so we hope you will stay uh, and enjoy that and uh, enjoy the fellowship time with us. Well, those are all of the announcements that I have for you. We are here to worship the one who creates the snow. We're here to worship our great Lord and Redeemer. Let's prepare our hearts to do just that. The psalmist said, Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Will you stand this morning for our call to worship? Hear the word of God from Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Let's praise God with our voices this morning. The hymn is 119, 119.
Let's go before the Lord in prayer this morning. Almighty Lord, Heavenly Father, and our great King, all praise and honor is yours, and we give you glory this morning. As we approach you this morning on your day, we approach you with humble and submissive hearts. Thank you that we are able to gather together as a people, as adopted sons and daughters of Christ Jesus. Brothers of Christ Jesus and adopted sons and daughters of the Father. And to be under the preaching of your living, eternal, and inerrant word, we plead with you and ask that you would guide us by your spirit. Help us in our time of need. Please guide us this morning by the light of Christ Jesus' finished work. May that be the, the guiding light of this morning in all of our worship. Give us open hearts and clear minds to be changed by your word. Holy Word. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And now turn to the next page, uh, the song, uh, which is uh, words by Psalm 23. Lamentations 3, 
But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Please stand and let's sing together, Great is Thy Faithfulness, hymn number 32. churches in China today. Uh, word has come to us this past week uh, that the churches are not allowed to meet. Uh, they're being closely watched online. Uh, there's uh, increased pressure and persecution and, of course, increased world tension and uh, many, many questions about what China is going to do next. Let's remember, pray for our brothers and sisters there. Uh, we know that the church is huge in China. Uh, God has worked in powerful ways uh, in the midst of severe persecution and oppression. Uh, isn't that just like our Lord? Isn't that just like our Lord? 
when his people go through the fire, he pours out the blessing. And let's ask him to protect our dear brothers and sisters. They're our family. We don't know their names for the most part, but they're our family. And so let's bring them to the Lord's throne this morning. Will you pray with me? Father, we come to you on the morning of your day. And we thank you for the Lord's day. We thank you for the Christian Sabbath. We thank you for one day in seven to remember that you are our creator because in six days you made all things by the word of your power. And on the seventh day you rested and you sanctified it. We remember not only your mighty creative power and acts, but Lord, we remember this day that you are our redeemer. And that it was on the first day of the week that our Lord Jesus was raised from the dead. And so we come to worship you this day. We come to set aside this day for you to engage our souls in the holy delights of worship and praise and service. We ask you today, O oh Lord, that we might seek you and that we might find you. We bow in your presence this morning, O oh Lord, to seek you with all our hearts. Lord, there's none like you. You are great, and your name is great in might. Lord, who would not fear you? You're the king of the nations. Lord, you deserve our prayer, our praise, and our adoration. And so we worship you this morning, our great God, the everlasting God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, as we bow before you, we want to pray for the needs of this congregation. We remember our family of the week, and today we pray for David and Jadira, for Emmanuel and Christian. Lord, we praise you for this dear family. We thank you for bringing them to Grace Church. We thank you for the role that they play here at Grace. We thank you for David's service as a deacon. And we pray that you will continue to bless and use this family and strengthen and provide for them in every way. We pray for Emmanuel as he serves our nation uh, in the armed forces, as he works through his ROTC training, that uh, you will grant him strength and, and protection. And Christian, as he uh, serves you, Lord, uh, in school. We pray for his stand for Christ, that it will be unashamed. Remember, Lord, those who have physical needs in our congregation, and so we pray for our sister Chris, who will be undergoing hip replacement surgery tomorrow. We also pray for Brenda, who will be undergoing cancer surgery in the near future. We remember our sister Gloria and her ongoing struggles with pain. Remember today uh, as well our missions committee here at Grace. We thank you for them. We pray that that committee will grow and prosper in the days to come as we seek to uh, even expand our, our service to our missionaries. And for our local mission this week, Akron Pregnancy Services, we thank you for the men and women devoted to this ministry. And we would ask for their upcoming walk for life that they would be able to raise the support they need for this coming year. We thank you for these dear people who have such a burden to save life and to see souls saved for the kingdom of Christ. Remember today our sister church, Trinity, in North Canton. We pray for our brothers and sisters of that congregation and for their minister, the Reverend Lee Hutchings. We thank you for that congregation and for the privilege that we had to help plant it. We thank you that it is now its own particularized church and growing and thriving. And we pray that it will continue to maintain a healthy and vibrant and faithful witness to the gospel in North Canton and in the surrounding region. Remember today our agency of the week, our Ridge Haven Camp and Conference Center. We remember not only uh, that ministry, but its director, Wallace Anderson. And we thank you, Lord, for that beautiful place tucked away in the mountains of western North Carolina where so many have met with you, where so many have 
found times of rest and refreshment and times of spiritual renewal. We pray you'll continue to use Ridge Haven for the glory of your kingdom. We pray today, Father, for our nation and for those you have placed in positions of authority over us. Lord, we long to see the men and women who lead this country do so in the fear of God and with the wisdom of Holy Scripture. We pray, Lord, that you will save our leaders, bring them from the darkness of unbelief to the light of the gospel of Jesus. We pray today, Father, for the people of Ukraine and ask that you would bring an end to this war and to the senseless slaughter of human life. We pray for your church in Ukraine as they carry on their ministry seeking to bring physical help and relief from suffering as well as the good news of your words of comfort and hope. Lord, our, strengthen our brothers and sisters and provide for them in every way. We think of the MTW crisis in Ukraine fund and ask that you will continue to funnel monies into that fund to be used for the help of your kingdom and people. Father, we would pray today for the churches in China. Lord, we thank you for the stand that they have taken to make, remain faithful to you. We thank you that they continue to seek ways to meet in private and underground churches. And Lord, the pressure is on them now, especially at this time. We ask, Lord, for relief. We ask, Father, for you to restrain the hand of persecution to protect your children. And Father, continue to grow your kingdom in China. We look to you this morning because we so desperately need you. We depend upon you, Lord. We are like Peter who said, to whom shall we go? Because you have the words of eternal life. Lord, to whom shall we pray? For you alone are the Lord of heaven and earth. And you alone can hear and answer. And we thank and praise you today that your ear is not too heavy to hear and your arm is not too short to save. So hear us and stretch out your mighty hand and do marvelous works and wonders on behalf of your church. We pray this today, O oh Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, the one who taught us as disciples to pray and to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'll ask the ushers please to come at this time for our morning offering.
Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we bring this offering to you as an act of worship and adoration. And ask, O oh Father, that you will bless it for your kingdom's sake. We thank you, O oh Lord, that we can give to you in this way as an acknowledgement of all you have done for us. We pray that you will accept it now through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. You may be seated, and at this time, children may be dismissed to Children's Church. If you will, turn with me this morning in the New Testament to Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. look out in the congregation this morning and I count, I believe I count five other preachers here. And I wonder, what on earth am I doing? I should be sitting down there with you guys anticipating cake. That's what I should be doing. But here I am. And here we are to sit under the Word of God. Let's hear Holy Scripture this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Just a brief passage the first five verses. Paul writes, This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy, or if you're familiar with the King James of this verse, that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I'm not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. And now we're in Genesis 47 this morning. Genesis 47, continuing our studies in this first book of the Bible. <clears throat> Last week we looked at chapter 46 and the arrival of Jacob and his family in Egypt. The reunion of father and beloved son. And this morning we come to chapter 47. It's a lengthy chapter, but we are going to read it in its entirety. And I'll ask you to follow along with me as we hear God's living and inerrant word. So Joseph went in and told Pharaoh, My father and my brothers, with their flocks and herds and all they possess, have come from the land of Canaan. They are now in the land of Goshen. And from among his brothers, he took five men and presented them to Pharaoh. <coughs> Pharaoh said to his brothers, What is your occupation? And they said to Pharaoh, Your servants are shepherds, as our fathers were. They said to Pharaoh, We have come to sojourn in the land, for there is no pasture for your servants' flock, for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. And now please let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best of the land. Let them settle in the land of Goshen. And if you know any able men among them, put them in charge of my livestock. Then Joseph brought in Jacob his father and stood him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Jacob, How many are the days of the years of your life? Jacob said to Pharaoh, the days of the years of my sojourning are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. and They have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their sojourning. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from the presence of Pharaoh. Then Joseph settled his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded. And Joseph provided his father, his brothers, and all his father's household with food, according to the number of their dependents. 
Now, there was no food in all the land, for the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished by reason of the famine. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan in exchange for the grain that they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. And when the money was all spent in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us food. Why should we die before your eyes? For our money is gone. And Joseph answered, Give your livestock, and I will give you food in exchange for your livestock if your money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them food in exchange for the horses, the flocks, the herds, and the donkeys. He supplied them with food in exchange for all their livestock that year. And when that year was ended, they came to him the following year. And said to him, We will not hide from my Lord that our money is all spent. The herds of livestock are my Lord's. There is nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our land. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for food, and we and our land will be servants to Pharaoh and give us seed that we may live and not die, and that the land may not be desolate. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, and all the Egyptians sold their fields because the famine was severe on them. The land became Pharaoh's. As for the people, he made servants of them from one end of Egypt to the other. Only the land of the priests he did not buy, for the priests had a fixed allowance from Pharaoh and lived on the allowance that Pharaoh gave them. Therefore, they did not sell their land. Then Joseph said to the people, Behold, I have this day bought you and your land for Pharaoh. Now here is seed for you, and you shall sow the land. And at the harvest you shall give a fifth to Pharaoh, and four fifths shall be your own, as seed for the field, and as food for yourselves and your household, and as food for your little ones. And they said, You have saved our lives. May it please my Lord, we will be servants to Pharaoh. So Joseph made it a statute concerning the land of Egypt, and it stands to this day that Pharaoh should have the fifth of the land of the land of the priests alone did not become Pharaoh's. Thus Israel settled in the land of Egypt, in the land of Goshen, and they gained possession in it and were fruitful and multiplied greatly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt for 17 years. So the days of Jacob, the years of his life, were 147 years. When the time drew near that Israel must die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, put your hand under my thigh and promise to deal kindly and truly with me. Do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. Carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. He answered, I will do as you have said. And he said, Swear to me. And he swore to him. Then Israel bowed himself upon the head of his bed. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's pray. And now, O Lord, as we come to your word, our prayer is simple. Open our eyes to see your truth. Lead us to Jesus. Fill us with your spirit. Guide us that we might read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest your truth. But we ask this in the Savior's name. Amen. Amen. You have probably heard the adage, a picture is worth a thousand words. And even if you're not familiar with that expression, I'm sure you understand the concept. Sometimes an example, something that you can visualize, is more helpful to grasp and understand an idea than a complex explanation. And that's the reason news stories incorporate photographs and sermons include illustrations. In the Old Testament, God gave Israel a series of pictures, pictures to illustrate, 
to explain and to prefigure the person and work of Messiah. These pictures were themselves prophecies. They pointed forward in time to the coming of Christ. And the term we typically use for them is the word type. Type. Sometimes we call these shadows. Now, when you cast a shadow, the shadow is not you. But it bears your shape. These types in the Old Testament were not the Messiah. They could not affect the reality of salvation. But they bore the shape of the coming Redeemer's person and work. These types, these shadows were tools that God used to teach and to prepare his people for the arrival of their Redeemer. Now, some of the very obvious types in the Old Testament are the sacrifices and ceremonies of Israel's ritual law. But then, of course, places were also typological, like the tabernacle and the temple. And so, too, were people like prophets and priests and kings. Now, understanding this concept of typology is absolutely essential to reading the Old Testament as Christian scripture. Through the law, the prophets, and the writings, God was laying the groundwork for the sending of his son. And Joseph was a part of that groundwork. Joseph was a savior who provided life for those perishing. But he was a signpost pointing forward in time to the Savior, Jesus Christ. This morning as we come to Genesis 47 and turn our attention to God's Word, Joseph again comes to the forefront of the passage. And typology comes back into focus as essential for reading, interpreting, and applying this text. Now what becomes readily evident, even with a cursory reading of this chapter, is that Joseph is a man of action. In fact, he is the subject of 23 verbs in these 31 verses. He acts, and he acts decisively. Joseph in this chapter is unquestionably a leader among men. And as a leader, Joseph pictures, he prefigures our Lord Jesus so that through the events of his life, you and I might learn to follow the leadership of Christ. Now, as we look at this chapter this morning and we seek to unpack its historical and its theological significance, what we're going to see are three hallmarks of his leadership that emerge from the text. The first of these is compassionate leadership. This characteristic becomes evident when we see the way that Joseph provides for the needs of his family. Now, it's been clear since back in chapter 45 at verse 10 that he has wanted to settle his father and brothers in the land of Goshen. That would be the best place for them. And so after meeting his family there and leaving most of them there for the time being, Joseph took his father and five of his brothers to introduce them to Pharaoh. Five of his brothers went before the king, and as Joseph had anticipated, he wanted to know what was their occupation. We are shepherds. So have our fathers been shepherds. And, and we know how the Egyptians feel about shepherds, right? They're an abomination. Uh, they looked on them as unclean people. I think the division here is between uh, city folk and country folk. 
right? Uh, these Israelites, they were just country bumpkins. Uh, and uh, they weren't as refined as the Egyptians. And so these brothers requested of Pharaoh, please let us live in the land of Goshen. And Pharaoh granted his permission. After that, Joseph brought in his father, Jacob. And Pharaoh was clearly impressed with the aged, wizened visage before him. How old are you, he wanted to know. I am a hundred and thirty years old. That's pretty impressive. I think the Egyptian lifespan at this time, if you reached about 90 to 110, that was incredible. But here is Jacob, 130 years old, and listen to the way he describes himself. Few and evil have been the days of my life. I find that quite interesting, isn't it? That at the age of 130, no matter how old you live to be, life seems but just a moment. James tells us that, doesn't he? James 4, 14, your life is like a mist. It's like a vapor. It's like steam from the tea kettle. It's there one moment and gone the next. That's why it's so important to be prepared for eternity. Few have been my years, he said, and evil. Uh, he isn't referring here, I think, to moral evil, although Jacob was guilty of some pretty notable sins. I think he's talking about how hard his life had been. He entered this world uh, struggling with his brother in the womb, deceived by Laban, uh, now destitute and away from his homeland, now dispossessed of the place he had lived. Indeed, few and evil had his days been. With the introductions over, with the blessings given, Joseph leaves with his family. And with the king's permission, he settles them in the land called here Ramesses. That's the name for the area of Goshen in the time Moses was writing. It's that region uh, in the eastern Nile Delta, perfect for shepherds, perfect for herdsmen. And Joseph settles his people there, not just as sojourners, as his brothers had said, but men who possessed land and property. And he gave them food. You see here the, the compassion of this man for his family. You see in this passage that the survival of God's people is secured by a loving and caring son. But you see that not only did Joseph provide for Jacob, his father, but he also cared and provided for those brothers who had sinned against him so grievously and sold him into slavery. That's a marvel, isn't it? Could, could we muster that kind of love and compassion for people who had sinned so against us? And yet the compassion of Joseph in this passage really pales into the background when we compare it to the compassion of the Lord Jesus. Our Savior, our Creator, ha has made us both body and soul. And He cares for us both body and soul. He cares for us as whole people so that He might make us whole again. We see the evidence of this in the Lord's earthly ministry. He too was concerned for the hungry. When the crowds had been with him for several days, he says in Matthew 15, Jesus called his disciples and said, I have compassion on them because they've been with me now three days. They have nothing to eat and I am unwilling to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. And so he took seven loaves and a few fish and he fed 4,000. But Jesus was not only concerned for people's hunger, but he was also concerned and compassionate when he saw the sick. 
Coming out of a boat from the Sea of Galilee in Matthew 14, 14, we read, When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. If there's anything we know about the life and ministry of Jesus, is that he made the lame to walk and the blind to see. He made the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. He even raised the dead. He exercised these miracles, however, not just as displays of his power and love. Oh, certainly they were that. But they were also expressions of his coming kingdom. In the kingdom, when Jesus returns, there will be no hunger. There will be no need. There will be no want. There will be no sickness. There will be no blindness. There will be no death. There will be no demon oppression or possession because the powers of hell have been vanquished. And there is the sign that Jesus cares not only for our bodies, but for our souls. When Mark wrote his gospel and described that, that same scene as Matthew 14, Jesus comes from the Sea of Galilee. He gets out of the boat. And in Mark 6.34 it says when he went ashore he, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them. He, he healed their sick. Yes, but Mark gives us more information. He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. To teach them the truth of God's word. Of course, the ultimate act of compassion is that of the cross. Where Jesus gives himself a sacrifice. He gives himself as the bread of life for the salvation of his people. Where Jesus lays down his life for his enemies. Paul, writing in Romans 5, says, For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for those really nice, respectable Presbyterians. No. At the right time, Christ died for us, the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us, for you and for me, that while we were yet sinners, while we were sinning against our Joseph, while we would have cast him away, while we were guilty of murdering him, as it were, by our sins, nailing him to the cross, yet at that time, he died. Our behalf. That is the depth of the compassion of Jesus. Our Savior loves us that much. Now, how should you and I respond to that kind of compassion? We ought to respond with gratitude, certainly. Do you know the little Seth Sykes chorus? We sing it here sometimes at, at the end of our communion celebrations. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me your great salvation, so rich and free. In Luke 17, ten lepers came to Jesus. Lord, if, if you can, oh, please, if you can, make us clean. <clears throat> and Jesus says, I will be clean. They went away to show themselves to the priests and only one returned to give thanks. And he, Luke notes, was a Samaritan. Where do we stand this morning, brothers and sisters? With the nine forgetful or with the one thankful? But thanksgiving should lead to thanks living. In other words, the proper response to, to the compassionate leadership of Jesus is to then imitate that leadership in the way we treat others. In John 13, the Savior washed the disciples' feet. And at the end of that 
uh, act, he said, now you go and do the same. How do we typically read John 13? We typically read it, well, Jesus is a nice, humble guy. You go be nice, humble people. And certainly that isn't wrong, but it doesn't go deep enough. It doesn't truly appreciate the context of, of John 13. You see, when Jesus washed the disciples' feet, it was, in fact, an enacted parable. And when you watch the events of John 13 unfold, the soundtrack of Philippians 2 should be playing in your mind. Jesus arose from the table and disrobed and tied a towel around his waist and poured water into a basin. Christ, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. Jesus, as a household servant, then began to wash his disciples' feet, to cleanse them. Because you see, this Savior who became obedient as a servant was obedient unto the point of death, even death on the cross. It was there that he shed his blood for the cleansing of our souls. It was there that his death secured for us the forgiveness of our sins. And then Jesus, after he washed the disciples' feet, he put his robes on again, and he sat down once more at the table. Wherefore, God also had highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, the washing of the disciples' feet was an enacted parable of the gospel. And if you and I are to go and do likewise, then what Christ is calling us to do is not just be nice people, but to incarnate the gospel of self-sacrifice and to draw from his sacrifice the power and the grace to then live out the ethics of the gospel in compassionate acts toward others. That's how we imitate Jesus. Our compassion must be gospel driven as we die to self so we can live for others. Jesus continues his compassionate leadership through us. And one of the primary ways he does that is through the officers of the church, through the elders and the deacons. You see, elders and deacons are like the two hands of Jesus, ministering to the physical needs of the body as well as ministering to the spiritual needs of the body. Listen to the way uh, our book of church order summarizes the scriptures on this. The office of deacon is set forth in scripture as ordinary and perpetual in the church. The office is one of sympathy and service after the example of the Lord Jesus. It expresses also the communion of the saints, especially in their helping one another in time of need. You see, Christ cares for you. That's why he's given you deacons. Our deacons are expressions of the Savior's love for this body of believers. But then there are the elders. It belongs to those in the office of elder, both severally and jointly, to watch diligently over the flock committed to his charge that no corruption of doctrine or of morals enter therein. They must exercise government and discipline and take oversight not only of the spiritual interests of the particular church, but also the church generally when called thereunto. Christ cares not only that you are physically safe and helped, 
but he cares <clears throat> that your souls are nourished and that you are protected and that you are fed the truth of his word. And so he comes to us and he serves us with both hands, compassionately leading his people. As a type of Christ, Joseph is not only a, a model of compassionate leadership, but he is a model of wise leadership. Wise leadership. Uh, several years ago, I was at our denomination's general assembly, and uh, a gentleman that I was acquainted with, he, he came up uh, to me, and uh, I, of course, immediately recognized him. He's the president of one of our seminaries. And uh, he asked me, do you know where the school's alumni dinner is being held? And I, I couldn't answer his question, but as he walked away, I, I couldn't help but think, I am their leader. Which way did they go? <laughs> now, in, in all fairness, General Assembly is a large, complicated event, and keeping track of locations and schedules is something akin to a circus juggling act. But it was still funny at the time. Which way did they go? Joseph here, a man of action, never wondered which way to go. His wise leadership amid dire circumstances was decisive and effective. Now we can summarize, I think, verses 13 through 26 rather quickly. The people come to Joseph for food. We're now into about the third year of the famine. And they buy food, but they use all their money. The next year they come, and, and they, they have no cash with which to purchase the grain. And so they barter, and they give their livestock for what they need. The next year, their livestock is all gone. Their money belongs to Pharaoh. Their livestock belongs to Pharaoh. The only thing they have left are themselves and their land. And that becomes Pharaoh's as well. Now, when you look at that scheme, if you will, when you look at the way this all plays out, three things become notable. First of all, Joseph provided for the people's needs and they were deeply grateful. He saved their lives. Verse 25, they expressed that, that uh, gratitude. They said, you have saved our lives. May it please my Lord, we will be servants to Pharaoh. But he not only saved their lives, he acquired everything for the king. Pharaoh now owns it all. And then he instituted a flat tax, a 20% flat tax. So that one-fifth of the crop every year would belong to the king and four-fifths they could use for food and for seed for the next season. Now when we ask how the wise leadership of Joseph reflects that of Jesus, we have to begin with the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30 when he says, and because of him, that is because of God the Father, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. You see, folks, Christ himself is the embodiment, the incarnation of the wisdom of God. Christ has all of the skill necessary to effect our redemption. Because in the fear of God, he obeyed the Lord. He actively fulfilled all the precepts of the law so that there's found no sin in Jesus. And he suffered the penalty of the law's curse on our behalf. That is his wisdom for us. But he not only wisely provides for our salvation, but Jesus also brings everything into subjection to the king. 1 Corinthians 15, we 
We read, he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are in subjection, it's plain that uh, he who put all things in subjection under him, when all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will be also subjected to the Father who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. God the Father gives everything to Jesus. Jesus in turn gives everything to God the Father. Pharaoh gave Joseph complete control. And Joseph in turn brings everything in subjection to the king. The kingdom is stabilized then for the future. And that's what Jesus does as well. How does he provide for the future of his kingdom here on earth by giving us officers to serve in the church. Ephesians 4 verses 11 and 12, he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. And the calling of men who would serve in office is that they serve in wisdom. In Acts chapter 6, when we have the establishment of the office of deacon, what did the apostles say about those men? He said, therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. I've always been struck that when Solomon became king of Israel, God handed him a blank check. Solomon, you can ask anything you want. I'll give it to you. Can you imagine God handing you a blank check like that? What did Solomon ask for? Wisdom. Wisdom so that I know how to go out and come in before these people. Wisdom so that I know how to lead them. Elders and deacons, brothers entering into that office today, this should be our prayer. That God would give us the insight, the skill, the ability to lead this congregation for his glory. To be like Joseph, to be like Jesus, to provide for the needs of the people. To do it for the glory of God. This is not for our glory. This is not for our egos. This is ultimately to redound to the praise of the God who has redeemed us. As we take all of the work he gives us to do and we lay it at his feet and we bring it into subjection to him. And then we prepare for the future. And so a key part of our prayer for wisdom is that we not only be men of compassion, but men of vision. That we, we be men like those of the tribe of Issachar who understand the times and know what Israel ought to do. Congregation, will you pray that today? Pray that for your leaders. Pray that for the elders and the deacons. That we might remain faithful to Jesus. And then quickly in closing, I want you to look at the third characteristic here in these final verses. This third characteristic of Joseph's leadership that makes him like Jesus, not only does he exercise compassionate leadership and wise leadership, but also faithful leadership. Faithful. The family is now settled in Goshen, they are prospering, and the time of Jacob's death draws near. How old is he? He is 147 years old. How old was he when he came into the land? 130. How long has he lived in? Even I can do this one. <laughs> 17 years. 17 years. Why is that so significant? 
It's significant because if you go back to chapter 37, Joseph was 17 years old when his brothers sold him into slavery. God gave father and son 17 years together. And then there was the agony of those years of separation. And then in his goodness, God gives them 17 more years together. I, I can only think of the words of the prophet who says, the Lord is able to restore the years that the locusts have eaten. That's the goodness of our God. Jacob knows he's going to die, but he doesn't want to be buried in Egypt. He wants to be buried back in Canaan. He wants to be buried, buried in the, the cave of Machpelah, where Abraham and Sarah are buried, where Leah is buried. Why is that so significant? It's because it's the only piece of property in the land of promise that he and his family own. Just a place to bury their dead. But that sacred spot became for them a down payment, as it were. It, it became a token of God's promise that one day all the land would be theirs. He wanted to be buried in Machpelah because he wanted to be buried in faith, trusting the promise that God would bring everything to them. And so Joseph swore an oath that that is exactly what he would do. He would take his father home to the family plot. When you ask how Joseph's faithfulness depicts that of Jesus, well, folks, we only need to remember that faithful is his name. Revelation 19, 11, John writes, Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. The author of Hebrews in chapter 3, comparing the ministry of Moses to that of Jesus, writes, Now Moses was faithful, in God's house as a servant, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house. We are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. And so what is the response of the church to the faithful leadership of Jesus? It is to hold fast. Listen to these words from Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Now, how do we do that when, when this world makes us waver? When our faith is often so weak, when there are so many temptations, there's so much to assail what we believe and hold so dear. How do we hold fast, brothers and sisters? The author of that verse concludes saying, he who promised is faithful. We hold on to a faithful Savior knowing that he has a never-ending grip on us. Christ is looking for faithfulness from us. As a church and from our church leaders. Brothers, as you come in a few minutes, you are going to be taking vows before God. These are sacred. We, we don't take vows very often in life, do we? We take vows when we get married, or maybe when we enter into military service, or we take an office in the church, or join a church. That's a very solemn thing to take membership vows. God is calling you to be faithful to these vows. But you cannot do it in your own strength. For you to remain faithful, you must hold to the one who is faithful to you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this solemn occasion to...
bring you officers into the church where vows are taken, but we thank you, Lord, that it is a joyful occasion. We thank you for the ways you are looking after our congregation, the way you are growing us and blessing us. And so accept our thanks now through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I am going to ask the three men who are being ordained this morning, if you will come to the front, please. Meet me down here at the side. These men were nominated by members of the congregation. Uh, they've gone through a, a time of training and testing. Uh, they have been interviewed by the session and found to be men of uh, standing Christian character and quality who meet the qualifications laid out in Scripture for the office of elder and deacon. And it is a great joy to bring them before you this morning. You voted on them last week. You elected them into the office. They're not appointed over you, but you chose them, and now they come before you to be ordained and installed into these offices. Our brother Greg Morzell, in the middle here, is being ordained as a ruling elder in the church, and our brother John and our brother Mark as deacons. Brothers, I have six questions for you this morning. As you take your vows for office. Number one, do you believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments as originally given to be the inerrant word of God, the only infallible rule of faith and practice? I do. Number two, do you sincerely receive and adopt the confession of faith and the catechisms of this church? as containing the system of doctrine taught in the Holy Scriptures? And do you further promise that if at any time you find yourself out of accord with any of the fundamentals of this system of doctrine, you will, on your own initiative, make known to your session the change which has taken place in your views since the assumption of this ordination vow? Number three, do you approve the form of government and discipline of the Presbyterian Church in America in conformity with the general principles of biblical polity? I do. I do. Number four, do you accept the office of ruling elder and do you brothers accept the office of deacon in this church and promise faithfully to perform all the duties thereof and to endeavor by the grace of God to adorn the profession of the gospel in your life and to set a worthy example before the church of which God has made you an officer. I do. Number five, do you promise subjection to your brethren in the Lord? Number six, do you promise to strive for the purity, peace, unity, and edification of the church? Now, congregation, I have a question for you. Uh, you fi can find these printed uh, in your bulletin, but this question is for the members of Grace Presbyterian Church, and if you uh, can answer in the affirmative, then I ask you to do so by the raising of your right hand. Do you, the members of this church, acknowledge and receive this brother as a ruling elder and these brothers as deacons? Do you promise to yield to them all that honor, encouragement, and obedience in the Lord to which their offices according to the word of God and the constitution of this church entitle them? Do you? Amen. At this time, I am going to ask the members of our session to come. And then we have other ordained PCA elders who are here, other ordained PCA ruling or teaching elders, uh, you may join us up front here, and uh, we're going to gather around these brothers. And then I'll ask you to kneel, please. 
the laying on of hands, we solemnly set you a part of this sacred work. Let's pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, it is with grateful hearts that we thank you for the church of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that you have laid down in your word what we are to believe and how we are to behave. We thank you for giving us, in the model of Holy Scripture, the office of elder and deacon. And now we come to set apart these men for these sacred offices. Father, fill them with your spirit. Fill them with wisdom. As they serve in the office of elder and deacon, may they do so with faithfulness and with integrity. Make them holy men who strive after purity of heart and life, who exemplify the greatness and grace of Jesus, and through his love serve others selflessly for his glory and honor. We pray this in the Savior's name. Amen. Amen. And amen. Gentlemen, you may stand. <coughs> We give you the right hand of fellowship and welcome you into this office, these offices, and to serve with us. Brothers, please extend to them the right hand of fellowship. And I'll ask the three men to. <laughs> You, you may not realize this, but you're also witnessing some very deep friendships here. Very deep friendships. Uh, the Lord has united the hearts of these men together to serve you together. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Amen. I now pronounce and declare that Greg Gorzell has been regularly elected, ordained, and installed a ruling elder in this church agreeable to the word of God and according to the constitution of the Presbyterian Church in America, and that as such he is entitled to all encouragement, honor, and obedience in the Lord, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. I now pronounce and declare that Mark Gidley and John Newbrander have been regularly elected, ordained, and installed as deacons in this church agreeable to the word of God and according to the constitution of the Presbyterian Church in America, and that as such they are entitled to all encouragement, honor, and obedience in the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen and amen. You may be seated, and I encourage congregation you to welcome these men at the conclusion of our service. I'm going to ask you at this time to take your hymnals, and we're going to turn to hymn 342, 342, Christ has made the sure foundation, and let's stand as we sing.
of your hearts and receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.